Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 1 through 21. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening... The disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men besides women and children. This is the word of our Lord. We've just heard 21 verses, and I bet you have not compared these two scenes in a way that would fit a single sermon. I want you to think, though, about how these two scenes do work together. One is a scene about a party with feasting, and the other isn't a scene necessarily about a party, but there is feasting taking place. One is a scene in which there are crowds present. The other one is a scene in which there are crowds present. One has a scene in which there is a kind of leadership, leadership of the head of the house and Herod. And the other scene, though it takes place in a desolate place, still has a leader, a leadership of King Jesus. I wonder if uh, this might help you appreciate how these two scenes work together. I want you to imagine yourself at a political rally. Thousands upon thousands of people. Maybe it's, uh, it's just right in our neck of the woods, downtown D.C. But I want you to imagine that you're at the political rally, but you're not a part of the political rally. It's a political rally for other people, not your people. And yet there you are, right in the middle, thousands upon thousands of people <laughs> none of whom have your same political persuasion. It's not your team, but you're there. And what we've seen thus far in Matthew's Gospel 12, 13, and now as we enter chapter 14, is we've seen Jesus uh, serving, ministering, healing, uh, teaching amidst a crowd that is very opposed to him. Matthew 12 and 13 and 14, Matthew is telling us that the opposition to Jesus is an ascendant opposition. Uh, It's growing. 
Many in the crowd have already seen Jesus and found him to be a lawbreaker, someone who hates the religious traditions of the people. In fact, Jesus has already been accused as being someone who is an ally with Satan himself. And they're conspiring to arrest him and kill him. And Jesus is being treated even worse than, uh, than the Ninevites treated Jonah. That's a reference that we find in Matthew 12. And at the very end of Matthew chapter 13, Jesus, he's not even accepted uh, at his childhood home, the village of Nazareth. He's hated by everyone. Religious leaders, people with power, but even just regular people that he grew up with in a virtually unknown village. And yet, what Matthew has also told us up to this point is that Jesus was gentle. He didn't fight back. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench. The words of Isaiah 42, appropriated to our Lord. He teaches in parables, which in many ways is a very tender way to teach. It's a great way to teach uh, those who have hard hearts and poor hearing and eyes clenched closed. The kingdom of heaven It's slow, and it's invisible, and that's not the way we would want to do it. But it is the way that Jesus responds to rising opposition. And you know, we need to hear that and appreciate that as we look at these two scenes. These two scenes do belong together. Matthew, he he wants us to feel this hostility and this opposition and this rejection to Jesus. Jesus is the one true God, but he's rejected. And at the same time, Matthew, he he wants us to, to feel how tender and gentle is the response of Jesus to all of this hostility. Let me tell you what I think this passage has for us this morning. This passage uh, it tells us that for the Christian, gentleness is an appropriate response to opposition. Gentleness for the Christian is an appropriate response to opposition. On the one hand, in the first part of our passage this morning, uh, verses 1 through 12, uh, Herod is opposing Jesus. And this is an event that happens at a distance. It's not something that's localized right around Jesus. But Herod opposes Jesus. And and he reimagines Jesus as some kind of reincarnation or resurrection of John the Baptist. And then on the other hand, in our passage, verses 13 through 21... It's the compassion that moves Jesus to feed a crowd of not just 5,000, closer to 10,000. This pairing of opposition and gentleness is actually very important to the Christian walk. Because for the Christian, gentleness is an appropriate response to opposition. First, I want us to just park for a little bit in verses 1 through 12 and and talk about this uh, opposition. It it turns out that someone has been watching the ministry of Jesus uh, at a distance. See verse 1, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch, he heard about Jesus. And didn't just hear about Jesus, he heard about the fame of Jesus. Who is this Herod guy? Herod is a a king. You see in the passage in verse 9, Matthew tells us this is indeed a king. Uh, He certainly has inherited his right of kingship from his dad, who uh, certainly didn't inherit it from Rome, uh, serves as an appointee of Rome. So uh, he's a king who derives his authority from someone else, but he's a king nonetheless. And he's powerful. And he does normal king stuff. He fortifies palaces. In fact, the palace in which John the Baptist is imprisoned is, well, recently renovated by this Herod. He builds cities, Herod does. Herod is uh, ethnically uh, Jewish, uh, so he uh, goes to religious festivals. He's a king. And imagine Jesus, he's noticed by a king Is that something that we might desire, to be noticed by someone who has power? But really what we need to understand from this is that Jesus is not merely noticed by Herod. Matthew wants us to understand that the opposition to Jesus goes all the way to the top 
It's not just religious leaders, it's also ordinary people. And it's not just ordinary people, it's those who are in positions of political leadership. All of them are in opposition to Jesus. I wonder if you've uh, wondered why Herod is dropped into the narrative at this point. Do you suppose it might be to show the great scope of the opposition of Jesus from a common person all the way to a political leader? I wonder if rather it might be this, that Matthew wants us to pause to uh, see exactly how opposition works in a human heart. It's not just uh, opposition to Jesus. It's not just unbelief. Matthew wants us to understand how that unbelief actually works, how it functions, how it twists a human being, how it directs the future steps of a human being. There's two things about opposition that uh, Matthew wants us to glean from the life of Herod. I think that's why we're given so many details of Herod. The two things are this. What do we learn about opposition to Jesus? The first is that opposition to Jesus creates a false story. That's what happens when someone opposes Jesus. They actually fabricate, they make a false story. Story. That's the first thing. Let me tell you the second thing real quick. Is that opposition to Jesus promotes a life of sin. If you oppose Jesus, the life that you live is not going to be the life that God has intended for you to live. It's going to be an ugly life. It's going to be a life of sin. Let's deal with both of those things. Remember, uh, verses 1 through 12 about Herod. Herod is dropped in that we might learn a little bit about what opposition to Jesus looks like. The first is that opposition to Jesus creates a false story. You notice that Herod, he, had never, uh, he never actually saw Jesus until Jesus' very last week. Herod hasn't seen him. He's only heard about him, and he's heard about his fame. In this regard, uh, Herod is almost taking interest in a celebrity, like he's uh, reading about Jesus on the internet. And, and Herod, we're going to find out in the, at the end of Luke's gospel, that when Herod does get to meet Jesus in his last week in Jerusalem, we're told there that Herod has actually desired to see Jesus. He wants to see Jesus. He's looking to see Jesus. There's almost a, a kind of quasi-devotion. Now, in uh, Luke chapter 23, we're told that he's uh, looking to Jesus, desiring to, uh, to uh, see Jesus, because he wants Jesus to do a dance for him, to perform a sign. So it's certainly not belief. But Herod, he's not, even heard, he's not only heard about this Jesus, he actually he wants to see Jesus. And surely Herod has heard not just the miraculous works of Jesus, but he's heard the claim that Jesus makes about himself. That Jesus is the Messiah. And Herod ought to have just enough religion in his life to know what that means. But Herod doesn't believe that. He hasn't seen Jesus, but he's heard about him. He desires to see Jesus, that Jesus might perform a sign of some sort. But he refuses to believe that this Jesus is God's own Messiah. And so what does he do? He makes a new story. I want you to consider unbelief doing that. A refusal to believe Jesus is not just being neutral about Jesus. It always involves some kind of story about Jesus, a refashioning of who he is, what he says about himself. His existence may even become non-existence. Notice what Herod does. You see it in verse 2. Matthew says that what Herod notices about Jesus is not that Jesus is performing miracles, but verse 2 says that these miracles are at work in him. That's not exactly true. Herod is uh, saying something like, uh, these miracles are things that happen to Jesus, not something that Jesus actually performs. Uh, we already get this, this simmering sense that Herod is creating a different story. And Matthew doesn't hold back. He tells us what Herod is doing in his mind. Herod uh, is looking to uh, Jesus as a, a reincarnation or a resurrection of John the Baptist. Jesus is uh, haunting this uh, representation of Herod's own guilt, or so it seems. He looks at Jesus and he believes somehow John the Baptist is. 
is there inside of him. Jesus has got to be in some way John the Baptist 2.0. You see what he's doing? He's making a story. He has to account for Jesus. This is what opposition to Jesus does. We can't just erase him and make him go away. In fact, for someone like Herod, who more, more likely than any other uh, religious philosophical opinion would be aligned with the Sadducees, there's no way Herod believes in any kind of resurrection. And yet here he is, as outlandish as it may be, creating this story that doesn't cohere. Maybe some of you have an experience of this, a friend or a family member who doesn't believe in Jesus and yet has so many opinions about Jesus. Have you wondered about that? You don't believe in the king that I believe in, and yet you have so much to say about him, that he's a charlatan, that he's a liar, or that he doesn't even exist. It is remarkable somehow uh, that the verbiage of those who don't believe in Jesus almost uh, speak, speaks more loudly about Jesus than the verbiage of those who do believe in him. Uh, you could say it this way. Many who refuse to believe in Jesus will say more about Jesus than we have contained in God's revealed word. Some grand narrative for why this Jesus cannot be trusted. Opposition to Jesus, it like paints us into a corner and it forces us to create a false story. And one of the reasons why this is the case is because Jesus really came Jesus entered time and space and history and world stories, a real person. That presents an enormous problem, a problem hard to erase. Well, not only does opposition to Jesus create a false story, but opposition to Jesus, it promotes an ugly life. And by the way, all of us are sinners, but it's not saying that to, to be a sinner is always to live in bondage to sin, uh, but this is certainly the case for those who refuse to believe in Jesus. Uh, Paul makes this very clear in Romans chapter 1, uh, where, he, where he says that a refusal to believe is actually an exchange of the truth for a lie, an exchange of honor for dishonor, an exchange of God for an idol, the natural for the unnatural, wisdom for foolishness. Opposition to Jesus, it promotes a different kind of life than the life that God has intended for humankind. Here's a little bit of the backstory of Herod. You see, Herod had an affair with his half-brother's wife, and he married her. And John the Baptist accused him, but, but historians tell us that not just John the Baptist accused him. Many accused Herod for doing this. But John the Baptist was the one who was imprisoned as a result. And at Herod's birthday, his stepdaughter performs for the guests. And she pleased the guests and she pleased Herod. And he promised to give her whatever she asked. She asked for the head of John the Baptist. I want you to look at verse 9. And I want you to understand that Herod, he felt sorry. Isn't that interesting? He felt sorry. But not sorry enough to not do it. And John the Baptist's head was brought on a platter. Presumably to be shown to the guests, but also to be delivered. Well, to be delivered to his wife. And I wonder if Matthew, he wants us to understand this, that this is a macabre display of life without Christ. This, this is where unbelief leads. What do you think is going through Herod's mind? Isn't it the case that we don't have to think for more than 10 seconds to be able to discern what's going on in Herod's mind? A crowd of his guests, huge expectations... He doesn't want to look like someone who is not managing his home, his home well. And he just does it. And it, it kind of makes sense. But Matthew wants us to understand that this is what unbelief does. 
Unbelief, it untethers life from what it was meant to be. In this one evening, a Herod runs headlong against God's moral law and the Ten Commandments. God created creatures for a certain uh, creatures in a certain way for a certain purpose. God created creatures in His image for His purpose and for His pleasure. And everything about us is meant to find satisfaction in God and God alone. And when we refuse to believe in Jesus, we are no longer satisfying God. All of our will, all of our thoughts, all of our loves, those are directed inward, as Martin Luther said, curved in on self. And this is what that life looks like. It doesn't always look like a Herod's life. But know this, if you're here this morning and you refuse to believe in Jesus, you still, you yearn for justice, you yearn for beauty, you yearn for mercy and kindness. All of those things are are bouncing around in your heart. Of course you have those yearnings, but none of those yearnings are gratified unless God is pleased. And to please God... We need to stop opposing Jesus and place our trust in him. But in the meantime, Herod's life is going to be a a microcosm for our own life. Uh, With Herod, it is esteem before his crowd. It is uh, taking a stand uh, for his own sense of rightness. It is elevating his desires over the requests and demands of others. But It could just as easily be just old-fashioned love for money, desire to pursue a career. It could be a physical affection. It could be the latest social cause. It doesn't matter what it is. It's not going to please God. Only belief in Jesus pleases God, and the alternative to pleasing God is living a life that is out of accord with God's purposes and his pleasure. See, for the Christian, gentleness is an appropriate response to opposition. And for us to see that, Matthew is holding up Herod as an example. Look at Herod. You see his opposition. And you see how he has to create a new narrative to account for Jesus. And do you see how his life is so odious and disgusting and horrible to behold? That's opposition. Now, what's remarkable is where the passage goes next, beginning in verse 13. You see, Jesus, he gets this bad news uh, when Jesus heard this, verse 13 tells us. And verses 13 through 21, in, in some ways, kind of takes us maybe a little uh, back in time. The, the, the time shifts a little bit. I mean, the entire, the entire story of John the Baptist has already happened. John's denunciation of Herod, John's arrest by Herod, John's beheading. John's burial, and the very fact that Herod is now seeing Jesus as a resurrected John the Baptist. All that stuff has seemed to have happened already. Matthew took us back in time for a moment. But now Matthew wants us to understand the response of Jesus against that backdrop of Herod. Matthew is giving us an ugly story, a story of that opposition and unbelief so that Well, so that we might appreciate what it is that Jesus is doing. What is Jesus doing? Matthew wants us to understand the response of Jesus to this horrible tale. The life of Herod is gentleness. And just for a moment, before we see how this gentleness unfolds before us, I want us to just reflect upon how we might handle that news about what Herod has done to John the Baptist How would you handle that news? Uh, We're told at the beginning uh, in verse 13 here that when Jesus heard this, he seems to have wanted to to retreat from humanity, to go away for a while. And in a sense, well, we understand that. But how would you respond? John the Baptist was Jesus' friend. John the Baptist was a prophet, a, a proclaimer of the same message that Jesus is proclaiming. In many ways, there is no co-laborer that Jesus has apart from John the Baptist. And to receive that news that he has been 
well, grossly beheaded. How would you respond? You know, we can expect a few things. I mean, we could expect this. We could expect that we just retreat from the entire world. If that humanity is bad, all of humanity is bad. I'm done with humans. I'm done with them. We could respond with emotional and psychological grief and just not know what to do with ourselves. This horrible thing has happened. I'll never be the same. How do I go on? And we might respond with anger. I'll be gentle to a point. But at that point, the gentleness has got to be replaced by something else. Herod is a bad man. Someone's got to deal with him. And it might be anger. Just think about those things. Retreat from humanity. Emotional and psychological grief. Anger. And Matthew is saying, here's what we get in Jesus. What we get in Jesus is compassion. Jesus, he tries to avoid the great crowd. That makes sense. But this great crowd, it just must be dealt with. And it's remarkable that uh, as readers of Matthew's gospel, we've already known what to expect from a great crowd. What have we seen about great crowds in the narrative up to this point? Matthew 12, Matthew 13, Matthew 14. What have we seen? Crowds are where you find opposition. Crowds are where you find the slowness and invisibility of the kingdom. Crowds is where you find more bad soil than good soil. Crowds are getting worse and worse and worse. And verse 14, it ought to hit us like a ton of bricks. And if it doesn't, you need to check your heart. Verse 14 says this, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Why don't you do me a favor and search through Matthew 14 and see if you can't discern Any characteristic or trait of any one person in the crowd that might show that they deserve the compassion of Jesus? And Jesus' compassion at last all the way into the evening, verse 15 says. And we aren't even told that they're in a desolate place until until after we're told that it's late in the day. And it's important for us to consider that this is probably not a life and death situation. 5,000 men and then add the women and children. You come up with 10,000 people. It's it's not a life and death situation. It just seems to be that there's too many people for the number of villages at hand. And Jesus is purely motivated by by whatever it is that motivates Jesus. It's not because the people are good and it's not because the emergency is severe. It's because Jesus is full of compassion. And he goes into the desolate place, into the crowd. And he won't be the last one to leave. Jesus, he's just not compelled by anything but love. And the opposition is everywhere going all the way to the top. And God's prophet has been killed by a fool who wrote a story without belief and exercised a life full of foolishness at a lavish party. And here we are in the middle of nowhere, a desolate place. And Jesus is in charge. And he's compassionate. You know, this uh, uh, compassion of Jesus walking into a crowd that doesn't deserve that compassion. If you're unfamiliar with the Bible, you need to understand that that is a theme that shows up over and over and over again in God's word. God's word from beginning to end is a story of redemption in which God uh, willingly walks into the lives of those who don't deserve him. There's a, a few places I could go in Scripture to describe this. I, I want to go to Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Now, Jesus, right after his baptism by John the Baptist, is led by the Spirit out into the wilderness. And this wilderness is a wonderful comparison to Adam and Eve's life in the garden. The wilderness has nothing, and Adam and Eve had absolutely everything. Adam and Eve were provided for every day. And in the wilderness, Jesus is hungry and Jesus is alone and Jesus is uh, accosted by Satan and yet Adam and Eve who had everything refused to believe in the world and what Jesus does is he enters the wilderness of our world and he shows us what faithfulness looks like love for the word of God obedience to the word of God 
Jesus does that for us in the wilderness. And Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 5 as a Jesus being the second Adam, the better Adam. That Adam was unable to rescue us and in fact is the man who uh, saddled us with pollution and penalty. And Jesus is the one who God promised. And Jesus is the one who lived perfectly. And rather than giving us death, gives us life. Rather than the imperfection of Adam, the perfection of Jesus is the righteousness that saves and the righteousness that leads to eternal life. How about another picture? A picture of uh, creation and Jesus' temptation. A picture of Adam's work and Jesus' work. What about a picture of the wilderness after the exodus? God hears the cries of his people, and while his people don't deserve it, God remembers his covenant faithfulness, and he rescues them out of Egypt. His great grace has come to his people. And Jesus, in verse 19, as he distributes this bread, he he looks into heaven, and he speaks to God. And what is Jesus doing when he does that? He's telling the crowd that it is God who is feeding them. God comes to sinners in desolate places. And Jesus, he breaks the loaves with hand and hands them to the disciples. And the disciples are the ones who take the bread, but it's Jesus who actually receives that bread and performs the miracle with that bread. And he's telling the people that I am the God who feeds with manna. And I am graciously disposed to those who are hungry. How about one more picture? The picture that we're yet to see, the picture that will come in the last week of Jesus, his ministry with his disciples at the Passover meal. All commentators notice that uh, here in this passage, we get a phrasing that shows up later in that meal with the disciples, Jesus taking the bread and breaking the bread and giving thanks and blessing people and handing the bread. Uh, All of the words and the gestures are there for the Passover meal. What is that Passover meal about? It is about Jesus wading into an opposing world. An opposing world that creates false stories and lives ugly lives. And Jesus, he comes into that world willingly, voluntarily. And he responds to that crowd with compassion and gentleness. Isn't that beautiful? We're going to talk more about that when we come to the Lord's table. But let me conclude with this. Let me just say right up front that all of us here understand that unbelief, it looks different. Not everyone unbelieves, if I can say it that way, the same way. Unbelief looks different. Sometimes people, uh, they don't believe because, well, they just don't give spiritual things the time of day. Uh, You might call it a, a spiritual laziness. They, un- they don't believe in Jesus simply because they have more important things to do with their life. And some people don't believe because the things of the world are just strangely enticing. They grab hold of them and won't let them go. Can't imagine life without idolizing money. And, and some, they don't believe because to them, God represents a father or a mother or a religious leader who abused them or abused others. And their disbelief, it's visceral, psychological. Can imagine an authority figure loving without abusing. And some don't believe because of philosophical considerations. They've just thought about stuff and they've read stuff. And Jesus, he doesn't measure up to them. And some uh, don't believe uh, because they just hate Jesus <laughs> almost like a fountain of hatred. You almost can't discern why they hate Jesus, but they refuse to believe. But hasn't Jesus already told us in Matthew 13 that the variety of soils is great? With these four soils, there can actually be a myriad of combinations. But what this passage is telling us is that even though we know that, that unbelief, it can look and sound a very different. Unbelief is still the kind of opposition 
that makes you make a story to account for Jesus and the kind of opposition that leads you in a life that is ugly. The unbelief really doesn't matter in this sense. Jesus is there. He's willing. It doesn't matter why you refuse to believe in Jesus. Jesus makes himself available to you. He will never be ungentle with you. He speaks to you. He makes himself known. He gives to you the gift of the church, of those who believe in him, to come to you. But here's the thing that we need to understand if we profess faith in Jesus. The disciples you see are doing uh, in this scene, this desolate place where they're feeding. You see that the disciples are feeding as Jesus tells them to feed. The disciples aren't performing the miracle at all. The disciples aren't giving thanks and blessing the meal the way Jesus does. The disciples are, are, are taking that bread and they're distributing it. That's the job of the church. I say it that way because I want to say this. Church, the opposition may mount around you. The marginalization may be felt more and more and more. But church, Jesus put the bread in the hands of his disciples to distribute. And for you, that means you are to be compassionate and gentle like Jesus. You look around the world and do you feel more and more isolated? Gentleness is your response. Yes, but but how far do I go with the gentleness before enough is enough? You go as far as Jesus, and he'll let you know when he comes back. That's how far you go. Jesus will return. You see, for the Christian, gentleness is not merely an appropriate response to opposition. Gentleness is a commanded response to opposition. Church, this is our life today. Would you join me in prayer?